And we just heard the flip flops going, dup, dup, dup. and it was one of the managers, and he was just stood there with his fucking chopper out, <laughs> and he just put, he just put his head around, and was like, right. Okay, everybody, it's holiday season, and that means there are stockings to be stuffed and elves to be cuffed. Well, today's sponsor, Manscaped, has gone global with the tools to guarantee you will score under the tree and mistletoe. Manscaped is the leader in men's below-the-waist grooming, and they have served more than 4 million men worldwide. If my maths is correct, that's almost 8 million balls. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with the code BFCGK20. Have you got one of these manscapes? I've just put some on. Right. I've just put- We're going to talk about what, what Tubes has just done, but we need to hook you up with one of these, okay? So Manscaped has sent us all one of these, yeah. and they are world-class, okay? The lawn they mower. Are, yeah. They're incredible. Lawn mower 4.0, and this is the weed whacker. That's the weed whacker. So if you're oh, nice. I, love, I love doing that. And Horrific. this is for your... Um, the, the boy. Swipe, yeah. I want to talk a minute about this ball deodorant that we've got, okay? Because we've just put some of these on, haven't we? Yeah. Oh my gosh! We, we had a little. We had a that little. was an interesting one. Oh mate, it's I, I feel my balls feel great. They're lovely, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, it's nice and warm, tingly. Yeah, like tingly, warm, kind of minty. Yeah, and it smells. Oh, good it as well. smells heaven, don't it? <laughs> right, get yourself some of this, guys. Honestly, that is the best stocking filler ever. This ball deodorant stuff. Oh, beautiful. Ball toner. Ball toner so as if well. You what want does, nice yeah. toned balls? What does the ball toner do, Tom? It tones your balls. <laughs> what do you mean it tones your it balls? It tones so it's nice and tight. Right, so here we go. So the lawnmower 4.0. <laughs> we're going to demonstrate it now live on air with tubes. <laughs> no, we're not. You can see it's got a nice little light. It's waterproof. It reduces the risk of ingrowing hairs and nicks. You need to get yourself one of these. You can just buy that, yeah, and put it on your balls because I'm sat here now. And <laughs> I'm I, feel, I, feel, I feel great. We're having a lovely time just with that. <laughs> yeah, just buy that. If you, if you, you haven't got much money, get the ball deodorant and put it on your balls. Beautiful. And let's not forget their famous liquid formulations, which include the Crop Preserver, Ball Deodorant, and Crop Reviver. Ball Toner <laughs> to maximise your hygiene routine. So basically, ho, 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 gents, naughty or nice, tis the season to perform. Okay? Yeah. Tubes? I think this is why I think this is why I do the reading. That was brutal. That was horrible, weren't it? <laughs> Leave, let me do it in future, Tom. That was horrible. That was horrible. <laughs> that was you, sir. Oh, yeah. We're all friends. We're all part of the Foscar. Get out of your snoz. <laughs> And don't forget, these bad boys here are all vegan, cruelty-free, dye-free, sulfate-free, and paraben-free. So you know their products are legit. These are bad boys, honestly. Get yourself some of these wicked stocking fillers. Look at that. We even chucked that in for you. What's on that? Yeah, my stomach caved <laughs> Don't do that, you dickhead. What? Just off the... Oh, it's off his... I thought it was off his hair. Not me, I was wondering what... No! Bloody, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't touch... That one. I wouldn't touch Quiffy Richards. <laughs> Oh, that looks like pubes. The dads can't stop talking about it. The teens secretly buy it, and the women will love you for it. So make sure you get your lawn. So make sure you get your Manscaped 4.0 lawnmower at manscaped.com and get 20% discount with my special discount code BFCGK20. <laughs> Hey, lovely people, welcome to another episode of the Fozcast. Now, today, we've got a very, very topical Fozcast. In the wake of a very high-profile managerial sacking, we have decided to make a pod solely about managers. What makes a good manager? What happens in the changing rooms before, afterwards, the aftermath? All that kind of stuff. And joining us in the studio today, we've got friend of the Fozcast channel, Tubes. <laughs> yes, boys. What's a guy? Buzzing to be back. Thanks so much for having me. I'm absolutely buzzing off my little titty bangers. Love it. <laughs> titty <laughs> love it. No, um, honestly, brilliant. Thank you so we much. Are, we are so happy to have you in here, Thank mate. You. Honestly, I know for a fact you're going to be, add, be able to add a little bit of insight to this because I'm sure you've come across a few managers in your time. I'm guaranteed you've interviewed quite a few, right? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So absolutely. We'll, we'll pick your brains as well. And as always, to my left, Tom Assey, how are you, my mate? Brilliant, mate. 
Don't nice to have it. you back. You're going to be you're going to be leading this today. So you're going to be asking the questions, picking our brains. Where do we start? Where do we start? What makes a good manager? Oh, Jeez, we'll just get straight into it. Yeah, wow. diving straight in. All right, what makes a good manager? Do you want me to give you? I'll tell you what I'll do to start the pod off. Right, I'll give you my ideal manager. Build your dream manager. Yeah. Oh, this. Uh, oh, and what are the uh, what are the uh, categories? I ain't got oh, a clue. I like this. I ain't got a clue. I'll just I'll just tell you what I like to see from a manager. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Cool. Okay. And we'll so, pick we'll pick holes in it. Okay. <laughs> so what I want to see from a manager is somebody that when they speak, okay, when they when they're doing that like interview, like sorry, not the interview, their first meeting with the players, right? And yeah. they're doing that, I want them to have like this thing where they just like hold the room. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, they hold the room, they hold your attention, and straight away you can tell that they demand respect. Not in a dickhead way, not in like a I'm the man, I'm the alpha male or anything. It's more of a kind of, yeah, you just, re- you can't help but respect this. So guy. you sort of take note, you go, hang on, this guy means business. Straight away, it yeah, makes well, you go, all right, yeah. this guy means business. I like what I'm seeing straight away. It's a good start, yeah? Yeah. And then you want somebody to be fully assertive. Me personally, I want somebody to be fully assertive in every aspect of his management, okay? He's got a set style of play. He sticks to it religiously. Everybody below him falls in order. All his coaching staff, for example, yeah? So when a new manager comes in, he will normally bring two or three coaches and sometimes a goalie coach as well, yeah? So he might bring three or four people in with him, all right? I want to see that every one of them are on the same page as them straight away, that they know exactly what he's going to expect from us. They know how professional people need to be, all that kind of stuff, right? That is a big thing for me, is is making sure the other coaching staff fall in order. And then when we're on the training pitch, when he's taking his session, he is, I mean, fully taking his session. Like he is leading absolutely everything. He is from start to finish leading it, getting after people, shouting after people, what are you doing? No, there, blah, blah, blah. And then if they do it two or three times, that's when you can really start to dig players out. That's what I want to see from a manager. So you want to see a manager that runs it top to bottom? Runs it top to bottom. I think to have a a really effective manager, it needs to be a guy that is a details person, attention to the tiniest little detail as well. So how important is that, that first talk he has with the team? Have you seen managers come in and straight away you're going, I'm not having him? Yeah, really. That's a really good question. Right, really good question. That first, like the, the best the best person I've seen do their first talk in front of the lads, right, was Nigel Pearson. Nigel Pearson, when he took over a couple years ago in the Premier League, right, he came in and, oh, like, honestly, like he just, he got us in front and everybody was sat there and he started speaking and I swear on my life, right, he was making eye contact with everybody, right? He's eye-fucking everybody. It's incredible, yeah? He's proper, like, looking at every one of it and you have to, like... I love stuff. You like have that. to reciprocate it. You have to hold their gaze, yeah? And kind of, like... It's it's so mad. Like, it's like he's almost trying to, like, bully you with his eyes kind of thing. But in a good way. Do you know what I mean? So you, you have, have to keep looking at it. You him. have to keep looking at it and then he will move and he'll keep looking at everybody along the way. But he did that... And as he's talking as well, he speaks with such authority and confidence that it's like he's just got the room in his hand. Honestly, he was so good at it. What sort of stuff was he saying? But basically, he's just he's telling everybody exactly what he wants from every single person. So he's he's setting the bar for how professional he needs to be for for all the players that they need to be. The minimum standards required, the minimum of everything, whether it's training, match day, around the place, how you talk to people, how you respect people, all that kind of stuff. He's literally laying it all out. So this and, one, hold on quickly. Sorry, sorry. This is a good one. I've just remembered it as well. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. He did it to us in front of the players. Yeah. Yeah. So he did the players one, and then he did a club one he did a a whole complete club one right so So we went in the canteen yeah yeah? we went in the canteen and he got absolutely everybody i mean like the the chefs the canteen staff the office staff the physios masseurs blah 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 he got everybody into the canteen right and he went really nice to be here lovely to see you all this is how it's going to work and he spread spout it all out for everybody so everybody's on the same page everybody and one of his big things was respect is basically doesn't matter if you're the player you're the like say the coaching staff you could be the chef the pot wash doesn't matter you speak to everybody with respect and it's as simple as that so with a manager like that well after he's spoken to the players will he go into like the the kitchen and go this is the food i want this is the food at this time is that attention to detail don't get me wrong we had we had all that in place anyway like you know we're a professional we're a premier league football club so a lot of stuff like that's already taken care of 
he will want to come and sit, go and see exactly what it is they're cooking though, what they're cooking, when they're cooking. He, so straight away he wanted to do, like some managers like to do it on, so say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday will be a really sort of heavy day in training. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a real, it's a blow. Like you have got no energy left, but you need carbs, you need protein, you need to refuel. So yeah. he will come in and make sure we have lots more carbs and lots more good stuff for them days. And then when you get nearer the game, it's a little bit lighter. You know what I mean? It's protein packed, it's energy, all that kind of stuff. But they do for sure. Like I've seen managers, they want to take complete control. But then on the flip reverse of it, I've seen managers more than happy to just do the match day squad, like the Friday, the Saturday game. And that's Doesn't it. that come down to the ownership and the, the, the board level um, kind of culture of the club? Because you might get a manager come in. Because these days you have managers and you have head coaches. Yeah. Now, in my mind, as a fan, they're quite different. Yeah. A manager, for me, is Alex Ferguson and runs the club top to bottom. Head coach gets given his playing squad almost yeah. and says, coach them. Is yeah. that fair? I've got to say, what you just mentioned Alex, Alex Ferguson there. He was the master of being a manager, yeah. honestly. Like, I don't think people really talk about this too much, to be honest with you, but he managed that football club from top to bottom, right? He would know absolutely everything about every single player, right? He would find out if they've... Like, I remember once, right, I had ordered a new car for my wife and... The car hadn't arrived on time, so I rung them up, and I didn't give them a bit, but I, I basically said to them, um, like, you know, the car's supposed to be it. We've already got rid of the old car. Like, we haven't got a car. Do you know what I mean? We, we're without a car. Like, it's not good enough, blah, blah, blah. But the woman that I was speaking to was the Audi rep for Manchester United, yeah? Right. So she had a relationship, this Audi rep, with everybody at Man United, including, like, the manager and blah, blah, blah. Word must have got back that I didn't have a go at her. I swear I'm alive. I, didn't, I just literally no, said, like, you wouldn't. You I just wouldn't literally know. said, like, no, you've killed us. Like, you've absolutely killed us. We haven't got wife. a car. Yeah, yeah. We haven't got a car. We've just had a baby. We haven't got a car. And he, he got wind of that. He heard about this, pulled me into his office, and he went, What are you talking to her like that for? <laughs> I was thinking, oh, my no. oh my God. Were you just like, mm. Yeah, I was like, Well, I, I didn't really. He went, <laughs> I just I'd known car. her. I'd known her for he, She's done there, blah, blah. And I was like, Oh my God. He hears about everything. Wow. Absolutely everything. And he, he didn't he know everyone's names as well? Everyone's names. Everyone's like, names. Yeah. Without, without People doubt. People would say, he used to walk down the corridor, but like, it's, all right, all it's right, unreal. So it would pop in. It would pop into every, every, every door. Club. Pop into every door and speak to whoever's behind the I door. I can't get over with like him, in particular... Uh, the memory of these people, these elite level, and they take the time, don't they? Yeah. And he's like a, he's like a everything to everyone, isn't it? Exactly. It's like a salesman, isn't it? And it's like you'll go, right, who am I selling to? What's their wife's name? What's their dog's name? Yeah. What's their children's name? And I tell you, who was world class at that. Who we did recently was Righty. Do you remember? Yeah, really good. Pulling out non-league when yeah. I played for um, oh, his non-league team. We beat these two one against this, and I'm just thinking that's incredible. But. Yeah, there was a couple of times where we literally said to Righty, like, how how do you remember that far back? We're talking 30, 40 years ago, and he's remembering an individual game against a lo like a non-league team, yeah. and he's remembering the goals that were scored and the manager at the time and another teammate and all that kind of stuff. I think he remembers all the goals he scored as well. He does, and yeah, he scored he does. so he does. many. But like, imagine saying. Oh, in 1991, away at Preston. We, we did right? it with him. We did it with him. Yeah. We went, he went, yeah, away at then. 330 goals he scored. What a guy. Can you remember all your saves? No. I can't, honestly. <laughs> I, I used to. I think as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm getting worse at remembering. I'm, I'm for sure of it, right? Because I used to remember literally every game I'd be able to remember. Yeah. And now, don't get me wrong, I've still got a decent memory of it, but like... When you play five hundred games, it's it, honestly it's hard. It's hard to remember. It's hard to remember. You just remember the worldies. Yeah, I remember the worldies. Yeah. There's not many of them to be fair, so they're not too hard to remember. So that is your your kind of you like basically you like someone that's direct. Yeah. That takes com that's commanding. Yeah. Okay. But so, what you said what you said a minute ago was it's down to the club though as well. Yeah. Each club has a different way that they approach hiring a new manager. It could be like you say some some. Some guys nowadays, they're not managers, they're coaches. Yeah. They will literally come in and they will take the squad that they're given and they will work with that squad. They don't even really get too much say on transfers, incomings, all that kind of stuff. They just have to work with what they have got. Yeah. It's as simple as that. So what are the do's and don'ts as a new manager? So if a new manager comes in... Um, How is he getting the players on side? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that Again, it's it's... I honestly think this is the biggest part of what's changed between new style managers and the older school of managers because I think 
The problem that we've got nowadays is there's so much money in football, right? And players are paid so well, so heavily that that all they need is an excuse to say piss off. Basically, is that they all they only need the littlest excuse of being told off, shouted at something to go. I'm not going to do it for you anymore. They are honestly, it's like it's become so easy for them to do it, right? So I think nowadays the modern manager. They have to be a lot more personable. Their people skills, their man, their man management skills have to be absolutely top. They have to know everything about that player, his family, everything that's going on in his life. It's sort of like you need to be a psychologist and a manager at the same time nowadays to be a proper top manager. Well, we had yeah. that with um, with Neil Cutler, the goalie Villa coach, uh, the goalie coach at Villa. Yeah, and he said the same thing. He goes, "My goalkeepers, I need to know everything." What makes them tick? What in, what what they in, what incentivizes these guys? Not always money. What drives could be them? Be time off. Yeah. yeah. What what ticks them but individually? He's got he's got four or five goalkeepers that he's got to manage. But he's he did it, he did it people. with you though, Foz, didn't he? So we were talking about it, and we spoke about this after the podcast. And and Ben said to Cuts, he said, "What I loved about your sessions was there was always a competitive element." And Cuts just laughed, kind of like in a nice yeah. way, and was like, "Why do you think I did that, Ben?" Because you're the number one goalkeeper, and I know you thrive off competition. So those, I don't do that for every session, but for you, that's what I used to do. So it changes for the individual, so, yeah, and it individual, would change yeah. the session, and it might be competitive. It might be just, you know, running through analysis. Some people might be incredibly data driven and want to run through every touch of the ball. You don't like that, do you? No, I don't. I like to... Because I, I think that's an age thing, though, because I've played football for so long. I know what I've done well, and I know what I've done badly. So I don't need really anybody to tell me. I think once you get to a point where you're repeating the same mistakes, then it's fair enough. You can go and approach somebody and go, listen, you've done this two or three times in the last three or four weeks. I think you need to think about what you're doing kind of thing. Fair enough, I totally understand. But I don't like the tiny, like, little minute details. Not at my age, anyway. Right, and so you mentioned there, like you're saying, you know, they've got to make an impression quick, the new gaffer. How long is it before the players start getting on the WhatsApp going, he's a bit of a prick? <laughs> 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 if, he, if, he, if he doesn't impress. Yeah, it's... Can it be weeks? Or no, it, it can literally be weeks. It can honestly be weeks because you can sort of... Like footballers are clever guys. They are. They understand. Yeah. They understand how it works. And you can see if a manager, I'd say confidence for a manager is the biggest, one of the biggest things they can have. Confidence is massive. And you can see if a manager's not confident. If he gets up and he speaks and you can tell that he don't quite believe. So author- what he's almost like speak, being yeah. an authoritative. It's like they have to be, again, it's another facet to it, but a bit like a school teacher. You need to, you need to treat them like school, like school kids almost. Like footballers, they're a bit like people in the army as well, where they're always waiting to be told what yeah. to do, aren't they? You're, they're always on a kind of like a schedule. You've got like pre-activation at 10 o'clock, out on the pitch at 10.30, we finish training at 12 o'clock, then you've got warm down from this time, and it's constantly like that. You go to a hotel, team hotel for an away game, 7 o'clock dinner, 7.30 team meeting, 8 o'clock this, like blah, blah, blah. It's constantly a, like a schedule-driven thing. And I think manage, like, yeah, like, what was I, what was I fucking saying? About the confidence, yeah. So And so, yeah, I think like when you've got a manager who fully believes in every single thing he's saying. All the players just sort of, they, they go by it. It's like, he's the God. Like, we'll follow you, it's fine. But it's not, like I say, though, when you get the ones where you can see they don't fully mean it or they haven't got the confidence to really drive it home or be- their own belief, yeah, it's it's quick, mate. It's within a matter of a week or so. That's mad. And on the flip side of that, can I, you, said you were sort of saying, like, you know, people like the discipline and stuff like that. On the flip side of that, can they be too strict? And then the players go, hold up, hold up. We're not, we are not school kids sort of thing. And just... Exactly that. This is where, like, I, I think being strict is a good thing. Like, if, if, if that's the manager's way of doing it, but to back it up, you have to have the people skills. You have to have, if you can, if you can back your strictness up with science and actual facts to say, this is the reason why we're doing this, okay? Yeah. This is the reason why I want you to warm down on a Sunday morning or straight after the game or do running or run down laps or something like that. If you can back it up with science and say, look, data shows, tests show that it's going to benefit you, yeah? If any of you don't do it, then you're falling out of line. You're letting me down, you're letting yourself down, you're letting your teammates down. That's when they can be like that, okay? But like I say, you've got to have, one, the facts and the data, but two, the people skills, the people being able to sort of put your arm around justify somebody it. and justify it, exactly that. But it's, 
when you look at it though, look at Capello when um, he banned ketchup. Conte's just gone in and allegedly he's banned ketchup and stuff. I get that more so on a club level, but when you go on international duty, you, you're away so infrequently. What is banning ketchup doing for five days? Yeah, exactly that. Like, it, don't me wrong. When you're away with England, sometimes it could be eight or nine days. But either way, it's making no difference to your life. Like, it's it's all it's going to do is serve to just annoy you a little bit. To be honest with you, what if it, you have pints of ketchup? Yeah, <laughs> nobody's drink, eating pints of ketchup. All right, I have a bit of ketchup. All right, he, does. he used to ban like butter though. We'd ban butter. He'd ban oil, ban oil, cheese. Like dinner times were like the chef was absolutely top class, and he would make the best of it all the time. But like. Just the little condiments. Give me some condiments. Do you know what I mean? Like a hot sauce yeah, yeah. or something like that. And what about like a, a karma manager? Because and you, we've known each other a long time and I know you like people that kind of match your energy. So how are you um, with different styles of managers? What if you've got, for example, a really calm manager that's quite softly spoken? If the authority's still there, yeah. does that Perfect. work for yeah, you? That's fine. Like I say, you're not, like, there's no sort of one size fits all when it comes to management, but the, the underlying part of that has to be they have to have the confidence of their convictions. They have yeah. to be able to back it up with stats and data and show that they mean what they're saying. It's cool. I don't mind being a laid a layback manager. You have to. I think it, like nowadays managers have they've got twenty five players in that squad, but each one of them has to be dealt with slightly differently. They have to be because you're going to have people at the beginning of their career. You could have 18, 19 year old kids who don't know the ways of how football work. They don't know how to be professional yet. Do you know what I mean? All that kind of stuff. Whereas then you've got the older players who they just do it every day religiously because that's what they've known for 20 years. So in that instance, you might leave the older players to their own devices and just let them get on with it and let them do it because you know they're going to do it. Whereas the younger ones, you can't really give them too much rope. Because they will go and hang themselves. Honestly, they will just they they will just go and run a muck. If you let them, if you give them an inch, they will just run a mile. Honestly, absolutely. Mm. You know when they, they say like, oh, that the managers lost the change room and and the boys have stopped playing for them. Does that happen? The players just go, Do you know what? Fuck this. You I can't play. imagine that. Well, I spoke you? to Jimmy Bullard about it on the on the on the golf course, and and he was like, he was like, no, nah, the players don't stop playing because they want to look good for themselves. Yeah. If they want to try and nick a move, but you see it, don't you? Like. You know, loads of results. They're losing, they're losing, losing. New, new manager comes in, win, win, win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it, I think, I think what it is, we're not going to do it. This is where this is where the mental side of football comes in so much, and it's so prevalent. And it shows itself so much because footballers will never stop playing football. They'll never, they'll never just hang up. The, they won't just like stop for a manager because they wanted to get him sacked or something. That that's not a thing. But what 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 they will do is subconsciously in their head they will not quite give it everything. They won't quite give it 100%. You know that ball that they might just be able to get a little flick on or a little touch on or a little block on? They might just hold it's back a little margins, bit. It's, but that, them fine margins at elite level sport, especially in football, Premier League, those little, if you drop it by 4 or 5%, that's the difference between winning a game and losing a game comfortably, honestly. It's, it's It goes across every walk of life, doesn't it? For me, look at it and you think morale is massive. Yeah. If, if the team's on their ass. And they've lost four out of the last five. Things aren't going to be good. And a new manager does that just pick people up. And the other thing is, well, it's the same thing. It's momentum, isn't it? Yeah, that's I like the biggest word in sport. Momentum is massive. It is. It's massive because you just you know, momentum is where loses become draws and draws become wins. Because yeah. you just. Yeah, yeah. But again, though, that's a mental. It's the mental side of it because you're you almost expect something to happen. So then it. Go, does go and happen it's honestly f the mental side of football is absolutely massive ginormous honestly and is, is there like loads of psychiatrists and stuff you have and what, what sort of role do they play I know it's nothing to do with managers but you said they're the mental side of it yeah we, do you just we, go in again we don't we don't have too many of them we don't have to it's mad honestly it's mad in football nowadays that because it's considering it's such a massive part of it I think football clubs are really really scared of getting them involved and getting them into the training ground because they're, they're worried that if they start getting into a player and really sort of picking their brains, yeah. they're worried about sort of exposing something or opening something, a part of their head that they worry about putting back together again. They they need to know basically that that player can go out and do a job on a Saturday afternoon. And I think they're, they're genuinely worried about a psychiatrist or a psychologist coming in and losing a player for two or three weeks because they need to get their stuff together. That's wow. interesting. I love that. It is really interesting. So when you talk about P Nigel Pearson, what about half-time team talks? Because 
over the years, I think they've changed, haven't they? Yeah, and they I think um, you look at documentaries and like Warnock, for example, there's a lot of kind of shouting. Yeah, yeah. What? How have they evolved over your career? Halftime team talks. Yeah, they have. Again, completely agree. They have fully changed. I've watched those some of those Neil Warnock ones over the last few weeks. How good are they? Christ. How good are they? <laughs> how good is it? Everyone just sat along. Yeah. Yeah. Piss off to Marbella. <laughs> yeah. It's so I want to see cameras back in the danger rooms at halftime oh, like that. Okay. That is world class, isn't it? It's so oh, so. Can good. you imagine Ranieri going off and one like that? Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. No, like they have they've changed so much in football like that was commonplace that was every half time it would have been a team talk like that honestly bonkers shouting screaming chucking stuff all sorts nowadays it's it's it is completely different everything has to be a lot calmer like the last few managers we've had at Watford for example you'll come in at half time you sit down and you're kind of taking your boots off for a bit or whatever getting a new strap in a new whatever blah 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 just sorting yourself out a bit the managers now they'll give you normally five or six minutes by yourself all the lads just by themselves before he even comes in so he'll give you five or six minutes of just like getting your stuff together a little bit of a chit chat and this whatever and then he'll come in and do his part and then he'll come in and give some more team instructions he'll get like nowadays like because there's so much technology and stuff we've got a massive tv in our changing rooms we'll have clips from the first half already edited up already clipped already up, done that he can show that he can go right play the clips and he'll press the, the, the guy wow. the media guy will press like the space bar and the clips will start playing and it will be right you see that there i need you to be more in that position you see what he's doing here all he's doing is playing off your shoulder and you need to be open to it you need to see that coming so when he gets a ball he's automatically that that is the detail we're talking about so that's the now. evolution so so tactics versus motivation yeah it's tactics nowadays because um, how much motivation no, 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 comes no, no. into it's, it again it's, it's whatever he's seen in the first half if he's yeah. seen a first half that is completely devoid of any kind of energy or willingness or just sort of basically just players going through the motions then he will he won't he, he might show a few clips but the majority of it will be going lads what are you doing like that this is ridiculous and then but then again straight away he can he's got the stats at his fingertips yeah so he can pull up the running stats and he can pull up the sprinting stats and he can pull up your heart rate data and he can say, wow. you've ran five kilometres in that first half. Last week, you did six and a half. Last week, you did five. Do you know what I mean? All that kind of stuff. There's no getting out of it. There is isn't. It, is that said in a calm way though? Or, or does the rollicking still exist? No, they do exist. Yeah, yeah, they do exist, but not. they're not so often. I think half time... I think half time has changed completely where you, you very rarely get a rollicking at half time now. You very rarely. Because I think... It's a big thing of trying to have a bit of harmony about the team still to go out and perform in that second half. I think they would. I think managers nowadays worry about exposing somebody so much in front of a team, in front of their unit, that it might affect their second half position. Yeah, so it is a lot sense. calmer. That yeah, makes sense. Makes sense yeah. I watched a, a clip recently, and I can't remember the player, and he broke it down in, in a quite a similar way to you. And he said, you've got five minutes to communicate your halftime message to the team. If you shout, you've lost control. If you yeah. start balling, you've lost control and you're not thinking particularly yeah. straight. So you get that five-minute message across in the most um, efficient, efficient and effective efficient way. Word, yeah. And it, it makes sense, doesn't it, really? Absolutely. But So here's a big question then, because you hear about players, and, and you always hear it, he got dragged at half-time. If it's at a half-time and things aren't working... What's wrong with making a substitute at half time? Yeah, it don't go down well. I was going to say, yeah. Why? It doesn't go down imagine, well. No, because no, it's um, it's it's again. You'd rather come off at sixty minutes. Oh right? yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah but just, if things it, aren't working, what what's what's the issue? Exactly, but it's an ego thing. Footballers are okay. egotistical beings. They are. So They're it's a very, traditional type. Yeah, it's a it's a traditional thing that if like Jose Mourinho a few years ago, remember him? He was hoiking players at Spurs. He 20, was, minutes. Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Yeah. Twenty minutes. He was taking players off. Like that is that's br that's even worse. That is brutal. If you get hoiked after twenty minutes, yeah, and it's not an injury, oh my gosh! I get embarrassed watching that on the television. Yeah, it's horrible. Could you imagine being the bloke. Yeah, it's horrible. Like that. Come on, mate. You've done your, like, really? you've done your fifteen what? minutes. Oh, yeah, it's, it. but half, half time's not great. It's not a good thing at all. If you're getting pulled off at half time, I, I can imagine for an outfield player, it's 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 a bit sort of like I say, the ego part of it plays a massive role in it. But it's a bit embarrassing almost. It is. It's like that player might have worked all week in a starting lineup in training to do a certain job, a certain yeah. role, and to get hooked at half time means basically you haven't been able to do what he wanted you to do. It, it, do you know what? The more we talk about it, the more you convert it to real life because football's its its own business it's its own job and it's very very unique but put it put it into our kind of work days tubes yeah uh, if you got pulled if you were put on a project 
yeah. then after four days, they said, no, not, not no, in front of everyone. Not for me, thanks. Off you come. Yeah, or you're at a, if you're at a team yeah, meeting and someone's gone, oh, you've been shit. Yeah, it'd be horrible. How would you react to it? And you've got like fifteen blokes in the change room. Like everyone just sort of like I can imagine. I don't yeah. know. I've not played football at your level. I just imagine a bit like. Ooh. But every, like everything gets heard. So like if a manager's saying, even if he's saying it in the most calm way, listen, you're going to come off, blah 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 blah. But look, like most of the time, if somebody's coming off at half time, the manager will come in and he will say straight away to the player, the sub, or whatever. You're on, and he'll say, "Unlucky, mate. Like you're coming off, kind of thing." He hasn't really got time to go and put an arm around him and explain all his decisions and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Don't get me wrong; I've seen it sometimes where a player's that annoyed with it, he's gone, "What are you bring me off for?" And then it's like, "Oh!" As soon as a player says that, it's just like, "Oh no!" Because then the manager has to be honest. There's no point bullshitting at that point. Yeah, you can't say, "I just think the team." He, he has to say it in an honest way and say, "You didn't really do what I wanted that position to do." Yeah, it's nothing against you personally, but footballers don't hear that because it's an ego thing, isn't it? All they feel is the embarrassment and like it's just a personal attack, and it don't go down well. It's have, horrible. Have you seen it? fisticuffs because of that? I, I don't think I've seen fisticuffs. I've definitely seen a few um, players flying Argy back. Bargy. Uh, not even Argy Bargy. I've just seen a few like players flying back at managers and. The manager then has to get a bit nasty, and it's horrible. Honestly, it's <laughs> horrible. The other boys just sort of sat there. Yeah, going, oh. oh, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. And it, it's that this is at this point where, like, you just sort of sitting there going, "Oh no!" Like, I, 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 t- I did a story on a podcast a few few months ago where um, I was talking about Tony Pulis. Actually, I love Tony Pulis, and um, we had just lost. It was the last game of the season, right? And we had just lost away at Swansea, right? And the very next day, I was going on a holiday to Mallorca out on my bike, and I was buzzing for it. All I'm thinking of, even in the game, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to Mallorca tomorrow. It's going to yeah. be incredible, right? Anyway, we lost the game 2-1. We were 1-0 up at half time, And in the second half, the big lad, Lorente for Swansea, he scored two goals, two headers, got in front of Craig Dawson, scored, yeah. right? At full time, Tony Pulis nailed him. And I mean nailed him, right? End of season. End of season. Considering it's the last game of the season, everybody's about to go on holiday for seven Nothing weeks. Nothing to play yeah? for. Nothing to play no. for. We're, we're, we are where we are. They are where they are. Yeah. That was all there was to it, right? He made a massive point of going after Craig Dawson. Nailed it. What you do? You let him get... That's twice you've done. Costing us, blah, blah, blah. Nailed him for like two or three minutes. Constant barrage, right? And at this point, as the experienced player in the team, you, I should have probably gone... All right, lads, come on, gaffer. Come, last game of the season, like you know, what I mean, got involved just to calm it down a little bit. But in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I'm going to Mallorca tomorrow, right? <laughs> <laughs> just, just You're let, in yeah, training yeah, tomorrow, yeah. big fella. <laughs> just let, just let him kill him. Just let kill him. Let him kill Dawson, right? And I know Dawson. Anyway, I was like, Dawson can deal with this. He's fine. Yeah. Dawson's is the man. That's what he's right? telling himself. Yeah. Yeah. Dawson's is fine. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow, exactly. Right? I don't need this. I don't need to get involved. So just stay out of it. So Dawson had to sit there like a good boy for two or three minutes <laughs> and just take. It, but you sometimes it's the best way to do it in football, honestly. Sometimes, if you're getting nailed at, yeah, you might not even feel like you've done anything wrong, just take it, yeah, just sit there and take it. And then, if you really disagree with him, go and speak to him separately or privately afterwards, all right. And that does happen quite a lot, to be fair. It does, all right. Best team talk at half time yeah. you've ever had. Can you remember an occasion where? You've you've gone in and it's changed the game, or you feel so inspired. Does anything crop up, pop up? Um, the, the one the one that always jumps out to me is when we played in the League Cup final for Birmingham against uh, Arsenal, and Alex McLeish was the manager. And Alex McLeish was a very good talker, anyway. He was he was a really good talker. Like the lads fully respected him. Lovely bloke, like really personable, everything. Yeah, but bearing in mind we're in a cup final, it was a big deal for Alex, but it was a big deal for us as well. And I think it was one all at half time because it was the one where Obafemi Martin scored the last minute goal against Arsenal, yeah. didn't he? Kind of thing. It was a mis- mistake from the goalie. Um, but I can just remember, I can't remember it word for word, but you could just sense the emotion and the occasion. The emotion and the occasion is the bit. We're in the Wembley yeah. dressing rooms, we're in the home dressing room at Wembley, and he's come in and he's got his like lucky Scottish heather on his suit and he's stuff like that. And he's just basically telling us how proud he is of us all. Like, one all at half time against Arsenal, we're doing so well, we've had chances, we've hit the post. So proud of you, lads. Like, honestly, like, even if, if the game was to end today, I couldn't be any proud. All of that kind of... And, it, like, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it now. Nice. But that's what it was. It was one of those kind of real... Like, it's, I'll always look back and think of it as, like, oh, that was just... Yeah, that was class. Because I'm not... You can see how much it means to him as well. It was lovely, yeah. He's such a nice bloke. Like, yeah. Because when I... When I obviously, I, the, the dodgy ticker, like, I'd met him years ago. He came on Soccer AM. And, like, he sent me a long message saying, I hope you recover. Oh, what a guy. Not seen him for doesn't need to do anything like that. Just like, 
He doesn't at all, does he? No, yeah. exactly. Like, How nice is that? Nice, yeah. just human level. He's nice. a lovely bloke. Nice. I love that Alex McLeish idea. And what really about YouTube's guy. about? You've Soccer AM over the years. You've you've worked there a long, long time now for Sky. Yeah. Um, do you notice like any like other jobs? Change of management. What's that like amongst the team? I notice change of personality depending on how well the team's doing. So if a team's flying, you do an interview with the manager, they come in, hello, choose, all right, mate? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that. And then you go, maybe go back like eight months later to do the same manager and they're struggling. It's like, all right, choose, how you doing? All right, are we going to crack up? Really? Yeah, not rude, just like you can just see them going... I don't want to be here. I don't want to be talking we've to got, media. We've got to be... talk. Sorry, mate. We've Go got on. to talk about when you did Daichi. Oh, and he just absolutely crucified my barnet. <laughs> <laughs> Your barnet, by the way, mate. Guys, yes. Have a little look at his barnet. <laughs> How on. good is Tubes' his barnet? Oh, the minute the Quip Richard. The Quip Richard. <laughs> That is world oh, class, right, mate. Honestly, yeah. tell us the story about Daichi and the Barnet or lack of Barnet. Well, we were just we were just talking. We were talking about he's got no, he had no hair. I decided to shave mine off. No, that's it. I had still had mine, and I, he was like, "It's about time you shave that in it." And I, I was give like, "Give it up. You need yeah, to give it up." And, and, no. he, and, he, and he just went, "Oh, look at look, look at the wing backs. Look at the wing backs. Like <laughs> look at the wing backs." <laughs> it's like just. Just shave it, mate. Don't, get, this wasn't get, in like a press conference no, in front of everyone. Like, no, this was no. This is one, one on one. I left it in the piece because it was bloody funny. <laughs> it was it's brilliant. Absolutely killing me. Daichi's funny guy, isn't he? Oh, he's so good. Who so out good. of all the managers you've interviewed, who are the top ones? Who are the best ones that you've you've interviewed? I'm quite biased, but I'm, I stand by this. This season, Thomas Tuchel. Really? My God, like what a bloke! Yeah, what a bloke! We just started talking about simply red. It's like he loves Simply Red, and he was like, he? "Yeah, he was like Simply Red, yeah, but you have to put it on a vinyl. It has to be on a vinyl, and it sounds magical." He yeah, goes, crackly, crackly. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and he's like, he was like, "Hold him back." I started singing. He wasn't having a singing, but he was he was amazing, like such a good player, and he was so interesting talking about his training methods. He, he like trains on triangle pitches and stuff. Yeah, what is this? I've heard something about this. It was like just to keep you thinking, and he was like, when I was in Germany, okay. Spatial said, awareness type. Spatial awareness. Then he got size three footballs. He was like, that's to keep him going. So it's not just always the same same size football. And I'm like, like I was here listening to you guys talking about that. I'm just intrigued by it. I'm just looking at him like that. And he was like, yeah. And then when I was in Germany, I think he said, he got tennis balls and then cut the tennis balls in half and put the, over your hands and taped up for the defenders so the defenders couldn't grab. He's oh got, he, my yeah. gosh. That detail, that level of detail, know, honestly, like... that is the sort of, I think that is uh, going forward, like in the future of management and stuff like that. I'm not saying everybody's going to do something like that, but that is the level of detail. I think to be, to be a top manager, I'm talking the top of the top. Yeah. Cause I, I did a, I did, I put a YouTube video out the other day and I said, I think at the moment in world football, there's probably only five or six top top managers yeah. in the world, okay? Klopp, in the yeah, Premier League, yeah, yeah in cool. the Premier League, we've probably got three or four of them. Klopp, Tuchel, yeah. uh, Guardiola, and maybe Conte, yeah? Maybe yeah. Conte you could put into there as well. So, And I think the difference between them guys and a good manager is that extra bit of detail every single day, religiously, relentlessly, just doing it day after day. It's incredible, isn't it? It's like, how do you come up with it? Exactly. It's like, you know... What, what what when you wake up one morning and go oh, that's, that's it that's it put right. tennis balls triangle pitches <laughs> <laughs> imagine trying to explain it so here you go guys here's size three football there's your triangle huh? pitch and there's some tennis balls slap them on your mitts <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> why why would we even question it because I'm not questioning it. no no, like, no hey, sorry sorry yeah, no yeah, no yeah, I know yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. not yeah sorry yeah. Wrong, wrong phrase but like when things have been done a certain way for so many years people continue doing it that yeah. way do you remember when Dave Dave Brailsford went into Team Sky. Yeah, completely and, shut And he up. did everything. And they and he said, why, Dave Brailsford said, why are you doing it like that? And the answer was, well, this is how you do it. He said, well, no, no, yeah. no, this is, this is. So actually looking at like triangular pitches and you just think, well, do it differently because Strip people are people are aware of the dimensions yeah. of a football pitch, give or take. Yeah. So actually, if you start training in something where you have to be far more aware of your surroundings. Yeah. I think, I think nowadays, sense. I think like... Again, I think we're not we're not that far away from managers will sign contracts where if somebody wants to come and buy that manager, they will have to pay a lot of money, like fifty hundred million. Manager pounds. transfers. Manager wow. transfers. I don't think we're a million miles away from manager transfers because 
Do you think, like Man United just sacked Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, right? They, they, they basically, the next guy that comes in, the next permanent manager Man United at hire has to be one of them top guys. Yeah. He has to be one of the top guys, yeah? There's no more beating about the bush for Man United anymore, anymore is there? And I think if, you, if manager transfers were a thing... You imagine if you could pick any manager in the world. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if you could pick any manager in the world right now, it would be between Klopp, Guardiola or Tuchel, Tuchel. 100%, wouldn't it? 100%. So, so, so you're, you're happy to spend £100 million on a player. Why wouldn't you be happy to spend £100 million on a manager? Because you know it's almost guaranteed that that manager will turn that football club around, wouldn't they? You see, you see what these guys have done. Why has that not happened? As I say, I don't think it's far away. I'm sure of it. I'm sure it's not far away. I can imagine, though. Can you imagine Jurgen Klopp gets bought from 100 million quid from Liverpool to Man United? Like, oh, my God. Like, that is just asking for trouble, for sure. But stands to reason, though. But you look at look at what Klopp's doing, and um, we were talking about it the other day, Where and look at the England DNA, where they're saying, OK, this is our style of football as a club. Yeah. So from academy, you know, younger than that, this is all the coaches. This is how we... We're all on the same page. This is how we coach yeah. throughout up to the first team. And the manager is at the forefront of that, isn't he? And you purchase players based on your playing style. Exactly. It makes sense. It makes sense. It, that's, the, the, uh, that's the only way it can work properly where everybody is on the same page. So you know that if you have a player coming through from the 20s, 23s, whatever it is, right? He has already been taught how to play that position that he's been earmarked for. So it might be a central striker, it might be a right wing, a left wing, it doesn't matter what it is. He knows exactly what is expected of him if he was to get on that first team pitch, yeah? He has to do it in a certain way because the first team players do it in that way. That's how the team works. Because what these managers have shown, Guardiola, Klopp, um, all them guys, Tuchel, it's not about the individual, is it? No, it's no. not about individual brilliance anymore. Don't get me wrong. It's brilliant to have individual brilliance. But the key overriding factor has to be you are part of a unit. You're part of a team. When we played Liverpool for well, a month ago and we got beat 5-0, honestly, Tubes, I, I think that might be the best team I've ever played against in my life because they were drilled to within an inch of their lives, yeah? But it wasn't robotic, honestly. It was... They, they, they like they wanted to do it so much it was insane and that's the bit for me that really opened my eyes right they they wanted to do it for each other so much it was insane right they, they were they were they were five nil up in the 80 89th 90th minute whatever it was and we got a foul we went to do it like semi quick or whatever Sadio Mane literally just sort of like jumped on top of the ball like almost picked the ball up and almost got a yellow card for it as well but it was so that yes. all of his team could get back just to keep the clean sheet. We need the clean sheet. So that it was, but that happened all game long. They were doing that all game long, slowing stuff down when it wasn't to them. When they got the ball, mate, they were rapid. They were on it and they all were on the same page. Yeah. But when they didn't have it, oh my God, like they, the, the little tiny sort of like using your now spits. Oh, wow. They were incredible. They so like were when, incredible. You're, when you're in goals, for, for instance, that Liverpool game, yeah. And you're looking at that. After how long are you going? Jesus Christ. This is going to be... Yeah, straight honest. away. About five minutes, weren't it? It was. It, they scored after about three or four yeah, minutes. Seven yeah. minutes, I think and, it was, yeah. and, and that, But you know, you know what you're in for. Like, they're so they're so drilled and they're so all on the same page, yeah, that there's times where they would get the ball into Jordan Henderson in midfield, right? And without even looking, he would do a diagonal. So he's running this way. He would do a diagonal over to there, over to Trent or over to Andy Robertson, the other side, right? And he wouldn't have to look because he knew they would be there already. <laughs> because they're taught that... As soon as it gets into that position, and we bro they broke the midfield line, they broke our back, our middle middle four line. Yeah, basically the wing the the fullbacks overlap. Get over there, get there, and they will already be three three quarters away up our pitch. And it's just you put it into space for them, and then they would cross it in. And because they're delivering it into the like the the touches, right? Trent Alexander Arnold and Andy Robertson's touch. Yeah, when they're, that ball is coming into them. Their first touch is drilled so well, it is insane, right? That they can do it first time cross, first time pass, dribble, take someone on. They know exactly what they're doing. All the time. Honestly, mate, it was a thing of beauty to watch, honestly. Wow. A thing of beauty. Wow. And as a goalie, mate, that worries you. It does, it worries you. <laughs> you could see this you, you could yeah. see this with Man United, like almost. You could see it coming. Because every before the season started, they go, they've signed this player, they've signed that player. You say, but yeah, but what's their playing identity? What's really yeah. how do they play? Yeah. And and when you look at teams, there's teams that on paper that don't look sexy. Look at Burnley over the years. Yeah. Burnley over the years. Found a way of Might playing, not though. look, but 
everyone knows their role. Yeah. Everyone knows the system, which is why they've had success by staying in the Premier League for so many years and doing well. Yeah, it's- exactly. I think that's that was probably the, one of the main reasons why we beat Man United on Saturday was we knew exactly what we were going to do in that yeah. game and we drilled it so you hard. You could see it. I, mean- it, I think, I think that, that when a new manager comes in, okay, I think... So, like, Ranieri's been here, like, just over a month now. I think it takes a little while for him to fully get a gauge of what he's got at his disposal, yep. what players he's got, what what they're going to be good at, what's, what's the best sort of tactics to use, what formation, players in certain positions. He needs to work with the team for four, five, six weeks to get a real feel of what we're capable of and the best way of it, like approaching things going forward. And I think the game on Saturday, finally, it finally did just click for us a bit, to be honest with you, where we found that, because we've still got, we've got a fairly youthful squad, like, Energy, like you wouldn't believe, honestly. Energy, fitness levels are so high in our squad that we can press quite a lot. We can press. And we've made a point of, before the main night game, in the days leading up to it, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to press from the front and we're going to press from here. So when he gets it over there, if he's got time, you can go and press, but not crazy. You can't step up because he's got his head up and he's looking. It can just expose you with the ball over the top, all that kind of stuff. So you know when and where to press. But it's like a chain reaction. Like Liverpool do it, Man City, all of them, they do it. It's a chain reaction of events where when that one player goes, he's like the, the leader, the catalyst sort of thing. When that one player goes to press... That other player in that position comes around there, fills in. That one goes in to shut that line off. Then press up. The back four press up to get behind that. It's mad, mate. Honestly. It was watching it against United. Like I was in the stand watching it and I was like, you could see it. You could yeah. see it happening. And the, the styles and the fact that you could see that Watford were just overrunning them. Yeah, they absolutely. were. Clevs was absolutely class. Clevs was incredible, really? wasn't he? He was like yeah. a rat, isn't he? Yeah, he's he was like brilliant. a little chavvy <laughs> rat. Was. I love Clevs. Well, no, he was little absolutely chavvy rat. Yeah. So when we talk about playing philo- philosophies... Is the dead ball approach, long ball, dying in football? No, definitely not, no, because there's nothing worse than coming up against that team. Honestly, there's nothing worse than coming up against that team. So I know I know Burnley are branded as that a bit, a long ball merchant and big boys and all that kind of stuff. Because it's a bit harsh. Yeah, I, I totally yeah. agree, mate, I do. Because they play a bit of football. They've got lovely players like Dwight McNeil, etc. Yeah, like lovely yeah, players, like proper, Burnley. really, really good. Um, so they do play for sure. It's just that... At their disposal, Chris Wood up front and who's the other guy? Um, Ashley Barnes. Yeah, Ashley Barnes. They're, they're a handful in the air. They're they're very, very good in the air. So why wouldn't you play to your team's strengths? You know what well, I mean? If you're going to... we were, Me and Tubesy were talking about this earlier on and we are saying that so many teams now, especially at youth football, everyone wants the kids to play out from the back and yeah. play through the thirds and everything else. But if you were playing against Man City or Liverpool and they want to play it out from the back, surely a change of style is better. Because if every team plays that way, the better technical players uh, will win. Mate, if you're playing against Liverpool, right, and you're trying to play out from the back and you're playing against Liverpool, you're going to get beat 10-0. You will get beat 10-0, yeah? Man United played them. Arsenal tried it, didn't they? Arsenal tried it. Man United tried it a couple of weeks ago as well against Liverpool. And Liverpool beat them 5-0, yeah? They were, what, 3-4-0 up at half-time, right? And virtually every goal came from trying to overplay and sort of messing about. They, they, Liverpool missed about four or five chances where they took the ball off them on the edge of their 18-yard box because they were trying to overplay. You can't play like that against Liverpool. They they press so well in such order and like oh, they, they, everybody knows exactly what they're doing with such intensity and such speed. It's almost impossible to play against. Man City are probably one of the only teams that could do it against them and try and play out from the back because they've got a goalie that can do it for one yeah. and then every single defender is open to receiving the ball. They don't sort of hide. They don't sort of sort of show that they want it, but they're not really. No, they want it. They'll pull out wide. They'll open up. They'll take, stretch take it. it anywhere they'll as well. They'll take it anywhere as well. And they've got technically gifted enough players to be able to do that, right? But you, so if you're playing against Liverpool and you're a Watford or you're a Burnley or you're, you're not going to do that because you're playing into their hands, yeah? So you're going to have to mix it up. You're going to have to go a bit longer for sure. Like taking a short goal kick. If we had played against Liverpool and I'd have took a goal, short goal kick, at half time, the manager would have nailed me. <laughs> he would have absolutely <laughs> nailed me because it's just asking for trouble. Like don't mm. do it. Because, but one, the team's not set up for that either. The team's not expecting me to do any kind of short passing. They want me to do a long ball so that they can all push up the pitch yeah. and we can get into a formation. Absolutely. And going back to managers, um, who's been the best actual player on the training pitch, Ooh. been joining in with training? Oh, actually joining in with it. Yeah. Did you see Stevie G this a uh, couple of weeks ago? Stevie G, no, they, um, he was doing some stuff with training in Villa. And it was like he was just I bet he strings. absolutely must have. Like he absolutely yeah. slammed a few of them as well. Well, they said about Zola when he was West Ham manager. Yeah. They were like, please stop. You're still the best. You're, you're ripping us you're still, you're still the best player. 
literally Noble Noble was like Gianfranco just don't play because he was flicking it like, yeah beautiful just, like, it's like Zidane when yeah. you see him digging I know like, still got it just cash as well do you know um, Gianfranco Zola's got a talking parrot but it talks it talks in Italian it's the maddest story completely well, I suppose it's about managers he was a manager on. he said he, he lost his parrot <laughs> he lost his parrot. <laughs> this is the God's honest truth. He lost his parrot, and then the next door neighbour knocked on knocked on the door and went, "Your parrot is outside my house." Because we opened the door. This is no shit. I promise you. And they opened the door, and the parrot was there, and it went, "Ciao." No, <laughs> I swear to God, oh, it's got to be Jan Franco. It's got to be Jan Franco. <laughs> they went, yeah. Oh yeah, is this your parrot? And he was like, "Oh yeah." And apparently, the parrot swears and all sorts. <laughs> Honestly, I promise you it's true. Gianfranco yeah. Zolo has got a talking But power. it eats but carbonara as well. You know, <laughs> I swear, I'm not winding you up, I promise. That's decent, yeah, that's decent. If you ever get him on here, I talk like, about We'll ask about When it, yeah. he talks about his parrot, it's hilarious. He's like, oh, the cheeky little bugger. He's like, just swears and stuff. I've never met him, actually. Lovely guy, though, apparently. The yeah, nicest. The nicest. The nicest. Remember when he that's got, nice to hear that. Hero. Remember yeah. when he got sacked hero. at, I uh, can't remember what Birmingham. time. Birmingham. And all the um, reports are outside the house. And he's just like Come making them all bruised. Yeah, yeah. Like massive yeah. tray, giving them all bruised. What do you want to talk about, guys? He's, just been, yeah. sacked. he's just been sacked. Yeah. What a ledge. Um, I'll, I'll need to answer your question. So the best player that yeah. I've played oh, yeah, with... Sorry, yeah. Best manager. The best, the best, the best manager power. who's actually joined in training, um, it has to be when I was at Man United, and it was Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. So when I was at Man United, right, I just got bombed out of the first team, told I'd never play again, and I was like, oh, God's sake. So I just got bombed into the reserves, right? So basically, I played for the reserves for the last sort of, I don't know, two, three months of the season before I eventually got sold to Birmingham. But So I was in the reserves, and the reserves team manager was Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Um, and Ollie, like say everybody, he's already said it about it about him already. He is the loveliest bloke, yeah. honestly. Why? Like, what? Just what a lovely bloke. Just a real people person. Like got time for anybody. But as as t- in terms of a coach, was really really good. I mean, really really good. So like the lads buzzed off him. Like he has that respect about him anyway. And he's taken the reserves at Man United. So everybody's looking up to him. Like I, I when I signed for United, he was still a player. And mate, he would just like. When it came to a shooting session or something, whatever it was, he just put the ball in the back of the net. Like, put it, he would just put it in the back of the net. It's as simple as that, yeah? He weren't trying to nail it every time, but he would just put it in the back of the net. It was incredible. So when he's your manager, right, he would come and join in. He would show the training sessions. He would show the drills, the shooting session, the crossing and finishing. And then he would stop it, do this, do that, try this, try that. And then he would join in in six sides and stuff like that. Never lost a second of what he had before. He was just the same player. He still could have been playing then, I guarantee it, but his knees were a little bit shot, weren't they? Amazing. And yeah. is there any managers who still thought they had it? D- and didn't. Yeah, tried to join in. <laughs> It'd like, be like, no, nah, come on, Gaffer, give it up. Nigel Pearson, <laughs> Nigel Pearson up front for Watford or something. Yeah. Oh, God, can you imagine that <laughs> stiff as a board? No, they, they, they wouldn't really... Alex McLeish crushing people. <laughs> yeah. Come on. No, I don't think we've had anybody. No. I don't think I've ever played under anybody that will try and join in. Um... It's asking for trouble, mate. It's asking for trouble because that is, that's like, if they're joining in as six aside, right? And that manager is not particularly liked by a few of the players, he's getting nailed, mate. Really? He, he will get nailed, I guarantee it. If that ball's there to be won, they'll win the ball and take him out with them as well. It's just a sort of, oh, I'm just I'm just playing football kind of thing. But that's their chance then to give a little bit back to yeah, the manager. Yeah, and it's fair game. And it's fair game and as well. You wouldn't want a nut from Nigel Pearson, would you? Because oh, he's got no a, chance, he's got, mate. How big's his nap? Yeah, he's bigger than any. He? He's a bigger <laughs> he's scared, than any. He scares me. Yeah, he's that a big That scares yeah. me. Inten- when you talk about intensity Mate, when earlier he, on. When he speaks, honestly, yeah, I'm right. like a little boy. I'm like in the school, like in the classroom or something, and I'm just look- going, yeah. yeah, I agree. He's, mate. Got I that, agree. he's got that quiet intensity where you think, you, you could, could beat the fuck out of me yes. at any, yeah, any moment. And I reckon he is double, double R. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> double Andy. Yeah, absolutely double, double R. <laughs> but there's that classic story about um, David Bentley and Nigel Worthington. Bentley went to, um, he went to Norwich, didn't he, on loan from Arsenal. Yeah. He was like, I was, didn't really see eye to eye with a gaffer. And the gaffer used to play all the time, like in training. And he goes, I was right wing, he's left back. And I said, he's, he's, keeps, he's smashing him. Nigel Worth is smashing him. Bentley's like, what are you doing? And he said, what you're saying? Well, you know, it's just game football, isn't it? He was like, crash. Like, like, he's got a like, play Saturday. He's like, this is my yeah. gaffer. <laughs> he weren't having him. <laughs> he's been told you've got to play him. No, so you, again, though, I guarantee you we'd have been doing that to try and like teach him a lesson almost. Like, listen, we're, we're in the championship here. We're in League One or whatever yeah. it was. Like, you're going to get this on Saturday afternoon. Like, you better wake up kind of thing. That's I the think maddest, that's good management, That's that. the maddest thing because that's exactly what I asked Bentley. Yeah. He went... That's why he was guaranteed. Doing it. it would have yeah. been, yeah. So he's you're told you that. You're you, had him, yeah. you had him on uh, the on, golf channel, didn't the you? Golf channel, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, he was yeah. Like, and he was like, 
Yeah, I think that's why he, he was saying that's why he's doing it. Mate, that's you're the not thing, from you know, Arsenal now. You you're know, really you know when these now. young lads go out on loan, like these young starlets from like Man City or whatever it is, Arsenal, blah, 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 Chelsea, and they go out on loan to like these championship teams and stuff like that. Mm. They turn up, right? And straight away, it, it's, it, it always causes a bit of a fractious thing when they first turn up because they're, they're this like new hotshot player, right? They're... Back at their club, they're probably still earning 25, 30 grand a week or whatever, yeah. But they turn up, they've gone into the championship. And in the championship, you get some horrible people, some horrible players, like players that have been playing football for 20 years, like 35, 36 year old, like centre backs, all that kind of stuff. They don't like seeing this 19, 18 year old kid turn up in his Porsche and his frigging BMW, Rolex. Rolexes, yeah. wash bag, trainers, fancy as you like, all that kind of stuff. They don't like that, mate. They will quickly let you know about it as well. But I think this is a, such a good thing for every any young player to do. Get out on loan and see it for yourself because it makes you grow up as well, honestly. Make you grow up Ooh. incredibly fast. What are managers like with loan ease? Um, yeah, actually, um, pretty good, pretty good. They, it's a difficult one again because if it's if it's a player, if it's a manager who wanted that player in on loan, yeah, if it's yeah. the manager wanted that player in on loan, it's um, they they they've done it for a reason, so they will give them a lot more. They will make sure they make an effort for them and all that kind of stuff. If it's a loan signing that's kind of just been forced on somebody, I'm not saying that he doesn't give them that time, but it's not necessarily a thing that the manager wants. So it can be a little bit of a, yeah, it's a little bit of a problem at time. So when a manager joins a new club, obviously when a player joins a new club, you've got to get up, sing a song on the chair, do whatever. Do the managers have to do anything? No, I'm with you as well. I think this needs to change. They've got to. You can't. They don't. They don't can't. do anything. They don't do anything. They um, well, not even their coaching staff or anything like that. We've dragged a few of the coaching staff up before. Right, okay. So when, to be fair, uh, Ranieri when he signed, um, the coaching staff, they're all there's three Italian lads, great lads as well. They all got up and did. Um, I ain't got a clue what song. It was like an Italian song. I know what it was because I actually bizarrely you just reminded me. It was. Um, Bella Chow, Bella Chow, yeah, Bella it, Chow, Chow, yeah, Chow. Bella Chow, yeah, because, Chow, Chow, yeah, because yeah. what's that um, program that the Netflix series? Where they're wearing the masks, they're in the bank. It's got oh, like, money heist. Money heist. Yeah, it's in there. Okay, that's what yeah. he said. He said I was the conductor. Yeah, I got them all up to do Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao. Yeah, Ciao. now they got. Yeah. Uh, they were decent to be fair. Like I say, they got the three chairs next to each other. They all put their arm rounds and they got their arms out and stuff. That's the, because not many coaches do that, you know. Like I say, it's a bit of a like, um, oh, I'm a coach. I don't no, have I'm to not do doing it, that. so I won't do it kind of thing. But now nah, they were buzzing to do it. To be fair, I was happy with that. I was really happy with <laughs> that. Ciao, that's nice though. I think that endears yourself to the lads. Shh. The lads see yeah. that, and we were all just like, oh. That is that's yeah. class. That's class. And Claudio Ranieri at the yeah, front, front giving it some white like <laughs> napkin out there. Oh, Claudio. What a guy. Do you think you'll be a manager? Do you think you're going to it? No, I don't. No, I um, no, I don't because I just think it's too it's too intense, and I I don't think I'm. I love football and I love the little details and that, but I think it would just be too time consuming for me. I think it would completely take over my life. I really do. Because we'll be I able would... to do the podcast with us. I was going to say, yeah. you know, you're about 10 million yeah. subscribers I, by I, then I, as I well. Don't, so. Honestly, I don't think I could do it because it would just take over absolutely everything. And I would, I would spend so much time there and talking to people and learning stuff and coaching and then looking at more videos and learning about the opposition and who we're playing against and what he does and what they do. And I, it would it would take over my life. I know for a fact it would. So I, I don't even want to get started in it, to be fair. I'd actually quite enjoy being like this part of this new wave, new model of like new modern manager that are a bit more personable and all that kind of stuff. It'd be interesting to see that you, like you say, you never know though. I'd, it, I'd like to think that people would like respect me and would like blah 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 because yeah. I would show them respect and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you never know, do you? You never know. You never know. Absolutely. Right. Interesting. Okay. What about we were chatting about this earlier on managerial approaches to fitness. Okay. Now, what I mean by that is you hear the line when the manager got to the club, the players were unfit. <laughs> right. You hear this all the time. <laughs> Surely that is a line that is buying the manager some time saying, give me a few few games. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Don't get me wrong. I think um, there, there, are, there are certain football clubs that are fitter than other ones. And a lot of the time, a lot of the time in football clubs, they, they have a fitness coach who is solidly at the club. Yeah. A fitness coach sometimes will always stay regardless of the manager. Yeah. But sometimes a new manager likes to bring his own fitness coach. Um, and genuinely, 
sometimes the fitness coach doesn't work them as hard as other ones do. And you'll always get managers who like to work their players harder than others. So like I say, Claudio Ranieri at this moment in time loves to work the players hard early in the week. So say we've just played on a Saturday, you'll have your Sunday off. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are brutal. They are brutal. Really? They are really hard work. Like the lads are running. So we'll do the training session and it'll be a really tough, intense training session. And then they'll always finish by doing running sessions. Yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the lads are dying of death. They're, they're, it's really hard work for them. But then Thursday is like a chill day. Like you'll go out on the grass, you won't do much, but it's a chill day. And then Friday, it's just pure tactics. Pure tactics, right. right? It's just sort of like you'll have a little bit of a six aside, a bit of fun and whatever. But then it's tactics, working on this with a, this with a, you'll have the mannequins out and all that kind of stuff and it's team shape and all that kind of stuff. So you drill down on it. It's a much easier session. So when the Saturday comes, they're a lot fitter, a lot fresher and good to go. Um, but yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. It is a little bit of a cop out sometimes from a manager, but there are certain managers that just don't work you so hard. And you've got to think as well, if a match squad is 25 players, yeah? Yeah. Only 11 can play on a Saturday, for 90 minutes pretty much. You might get two or three that will come on and play half an hour. Then you've got another five maybe on the bench that don't come on. And then you've got another seven or eight, yeah. either in the stands or back at the training ground that have done nothing that day. So it's very easy to sort of almost forget about players and what they've done. Nowadays, it's like it's virtually every player has a schedule, every player. So they'll kind of know if he's going to be in the match day squad. They'll know if he's going to play minutes and everything is literally because everybody wears heart rate monitors. They wear their GPS tracking. It's done, it's done down to the millimetre, honestly, of exactly what they've done. So they know that everybody, whether they're played on the Saturday or not, they'll do extra running on a Saturday morning or something or a Sunday, they'll have to come in on a Sunday or so that everybody does get to pick it up. But some managers just don't work the players as hard as others. What manager has beasted you the most? Who's been the real uh, bastard? Do you know the worst, the worst preseason training I've ever been on is Tony Pulis's preseason training. It is the most devil thing ever, ever made Everyone up. Everyone says that. So he does, he, he always goes every year. He'll always go to um, Austria. So, it's the first week of preseason training. We literally, you don't do anything when you. So, so, say you're due back in on the 1st of June, yeah? July, sorry, 1st of July. You literally meet up knowing that you're flying to Austria that day, yeah? You meet up, you fly to Austria. The first, like, you'll get there in the afternoon or whatever. Straight away, you're doing an evening session of football. It's football, yeah? yeah. It's cool. It's just like a little breaker. But then at the end of that session, he's right, lads, this is how the week's going to work, okay? 5 30 tomorrow morning. Yeah, everybody's phone will ring in their 5.30. Everybody's phone will ring in their bedrooms. Everybody's, yeah? You will be downstairs in reception at 5.45. And, <laughs> yeah? And at, and at 5.45, we'll walk to the hill. And he, he chooses the same hotel every year because there's a hill out the back, yeah? And it is a bitch of a hill. It is a bitch of a hill, right? It's disgusting. And... So the same hill every every single day, every morning, 5.45, we start walking out over to it. And it's it's Austria, it's in the summer, it's nice. The weather's lovely. Like, yeah. you know what I mean, you can still wear your shorts and all that kind of stuff. But it is literally, right, see this hill? We're all going to walk down it together, yeah? He will stay at the top. The coaches will walk him down. They'll have to do shuttles, basically, up and down. And that, what he'll do is he'll get them to run up, but running downhill is actually quite bad for you, like Achilles and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So what he does is he'll have a couple vans or golf carts and it will take them back down the hill. It's bonkers, mate, honestly. <laughs> bonkers. It'll drive them back down the hill. Ready, to, ready for some more, right? Yeah, so they'll have, they'll have like, what, two minutes to run up the hill or whatever, two or three minutes to run up this hill, and then the thing will take them down slowly. They get another minute's rest at the bottom, back up again. Notice, Tubes, he's saying they. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I don't have to do running because I'm a goalkeeper, right? Oh, so goalies okay. don't do running, right? But you don't get No, home. I do the bike. I bike up it. So biking's brutal up a hill, mate. When you're 93 yeah, yeah, kilo, yeah. Right? it's just as bad, I'd say. Um, it's horrible, mate. <laughs> so, so how tolerant are they when a player says, like, if you've got a slightly older player and he'll go, oh, gaffer, I need to manage. Is there any kind of bullshit in him around? Nah, he knows. He, 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 do you know what? Tony Pulis was so good at respecting the player for what, who they are and what they need and stuff like that. And to be fair, they are driven quite a lot by the, the medical staff. So if a medical staff says, 
no, listen, he can't run up it this morning. Just let him let him do like a couple laps on the bike, but that'll do for him this morning. Yeah, don't get me wrong. You're only doing this to the older players, by the way. The younger players, no way. You're running, mate. You are. When when I first signed for Stoke City, yeah, I'll go off topic. Yeah, when I first signed for Stoke City, Tony Pugh was my first manager. Yeah, at Stoke City. How old were you? I was like 18, 19, and we in the summer we went to this local hill in Stoke. Yeah, and we're running up and down the hill in a pre-season thing. Right, I got to the top of the hill, and he was there. Come on, son. It's as he says, come on, son. And I was sick, yeah? As he said it, I went, and I chucked up there, and he went, he, he literally walked behind me, patted my back, and went, get yourself down, come on, well done, keep going. He'd just seen me be sick, right? But I was 19 years old, he don't give a shit, mate. He didn't give a shit, he was like, carry on doing it again. So anyway, sorry, so yeah, so we're in Austria, it's, um, they, you'll do the running session for an hour, it's an hour's running session, it's horrible, it's horrible, right? Um, but then what he'll do is, right, he's like, lads, this week in Austria, he says, I don't want to see you walking around the place. He says, I don't even want to see you on the corridors. He says, I don't want to see you doing anything other than running up a hill, <laughs> training session, <laughs> honestly, training session in the afternoon, because we'll tra start training again at one o'clock yeah. in the afternoon, and then we'll start training again at six o'clock at night, okay? So it's three sessions a day, and he was like, I don't want to see you doing anything other than running, training, training that's all i want you to do he said i don't want you mingling i don't want you in each other's rooms lie what? on your bed what are you doing? He, he wants you to lie on your bed recover and train and that's it he's like it's a week we do it for a week suck it up get on with it but write this week off as literally just that right and he does it every single season of every single club he's ever been at I used to love it. I we've, won't lie. I loved it. We've got to get Tony Pulis That's, on the Foscast. That is we we've got to get to. Tony Pulis. He's the man, honestly. And it, I used to love it because Austria is a beautiful place, right? Have Absolutely you beautiful. Have you seen any of it? No, well, to saw, be fair, yeah. Saw, so you're, 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 out, you're in the mountains anyway. So you look around, you're just like, oh my God, this is incredible. Like, what I got to like. But he would go out in the afternoons on his bike and stuff, like messing about and stuff like that. He's wicked. What a guy. What a lovely guy. He's got to be your favourite manager because you probably. always tell stories. Yeah, man. probably. You need, to, you need to get him on it. Yeah, I will you do. I will do. Do you know what I loved about Tony Pulis? He was just honest he was so yeah, yeah, open yeah. and so honest right and like I say if I had been shit he would happily put his arm around me and say you were so shit like never mind though come on blah 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 I remember oh, if you, again you've been really bad lately I oh, listen I'm gonna not I'm not gonna play you tomorrow but you know keep yourself fit blah 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 and but he would tell you he would tell you to your face yeah I suppose you respect that, exactly you can't help but respect it you can't and he would always have backup like he would have stats and he would have figures and he would tell you happily he's that. class That's mate brilliant. yeah he's wicked so what manager would you say has been the biggest influence on your career? Oh, biggest influence. Um, I would say probably A.D. Boothroyd mm. or um, Roy. Yeah. Roy Hodgson. Roy, sorry, Roy Hodgson. Yeah. Um, A.D. Boothroyd, I think, because he was my first, I'd say he was my first proper, proper manager where um, I've, I joined just joined Watford on loan from Man United and I was super wet behind the ears I didn't really understand how being a professional worked how being a footballer worked and so all of a sudden I'd gone from signing for Man United straight out on loan to Watford straight into the first team and it's like just go and do it just go and play and I didn't really know how to deal with it all but Ailey Boothroyd has got a massive history a massive like learning of psychology and how the brain works and how people work his people skills are incredible and he was so so good at sometimes giving me tough love but other times explaining it to me and making me feel like i used to go into each game like feeling a million dollars because he would make a point of coming over to me and going you're going to save us today as always you're going to save us today you're going to be the man honestly you're incredible you're the best and in the media we would always be saying he's the best he's the best young guy i've ever seen he's going to be incredible he's going to be england's number one he's going to be man united he's the... and like that that's as a young amazing. kid oh that's all i needed honestly so every day i was going into every game thinking oh, i'm the man here this is incredible and i want to do it for him as yeah, well I exactly that because we had that relationship so i loved him to bits and then roy roy hodgson yeah i just again i just can't I can't say enough good things about him. He took me to a World Cup with England. Um, he actually gave me a game against Costa Rica, so I played at a World Cup finals. Um, but on like a just on a human level, a personal level, like as good as you get, honestly, as good as you get. What a guy. Lovely, lovely bloke. Is it true that Roy Hodgson, every day at training, used to go around the whole squad? Shaking hands. Yeah. Yeah. His, his thing was shaking hands. Yeah. He'd always shake everyone's hands. He was incredible, honestly. What a person. What a lovely, lovely every, person. But every morning, wasn't it? Yeah, every, every morning, morning. Going around every Good morning. Good morning. And he would go and he would go into canteen. Again, kitchen staff, canteen, dinner ladies, 
Good morning. Good morning. You're How not are you? in the game that long. Love that. No, you know what? He, he used to love. love he used to love having a chat and a conversation as well. So he would like he would come and sit on the players' table, but he would sit next to somebody or sit next to the, and then he would just start talking and chatting. And it wasn't like weird, awkward. You know, like sometimes the manager comes and everybody's a bit like, yeah. oh. mm -hmm. it, it's not like it wasn't like that. You could genuinely sit there, feel at ease still, but like chat to him about something. It was class. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Brilliant. Nice, different styles, isn't it? It's yeah. like anything. Uh, what about you, Tubes? Working for Sky over the years, uh, what kind of management do you, do you work well under? Well, it's like Ben just mentioned there, like the AB Booth ride, like it was always nice and stuff. Like with, with Fenners at Soccer AM, when I, you know, we've done the alcohol chat and all that, but when I was going through that, he was coming around, I was staying at my mum's at the time because I couldn't be trusted to be at my own house, but Fenners would come round and like come to my house and be like, hey, you know, how is, how is he, how are you? Do you know what I mean? So that, that sort of management was like, this bloke's struggling here. Like, and so it's more than a boss. So you want to do it for him. You yeah, want to work yeah, yeah. hard for him. So, yeah, but there's been, <laughs> there's been times, like you said earlier, was like some producers, when Soccer AM went through that four, three or four or five year period where, let's be honest, it, was, it wasn't very good. And like, you, you go, hey, he's the new producer. I don't want to mention his name or their names. But you'd mention, they go, in the first time you spoke to him, you were like... This ain't gonna work. Oh, you could just tell straight away. Straight away. That's really? why. I, that's why I asked the question about just managers. Just a complete change of energy. You just knew to what straight away. He's like, he's not right for this show. Is that because? Is that because it's such a big company? They'll have gone. We'll take producer A from this company, from this show, and move them into this. No, it's because the new producer, the head producer, got the job for however he got the job. But then he'd bring two people in under him. So that he'd bring him from like real TV, if you like, your ITV, your BBC, not serious and TV. Soccer, yeah, yeah. And they'd be like, their ideas for the show, they start speaking, and you'd be thinking in your head, this is going to absolutely nosedive. So you'd know straight away. Well, um, you obviously, with uh, your YouTube channel, yeah. um, and Tube and Angie's Golf Life, yeah. what, you, you're the main man of the channel. What are you like as a manager? Oh, well, to be fair, the raving fair, pig. <laughs> to be fair, it's, it's me and Ange. We both do it. On and, a level. And, and love is, there's only three of us, yeah. So. Like, yeah, okay, I'm, I might sort the guests out, but then Ange will be doing, you know, the, the Facebook clips and stuff like that. So I wouldn't say I'm the main man. I'd say we're both... What we're both What do you think your management style would be? Um, fair, but I, I, if things aren't being done right, I get the ump. Yeah. And I'm not really a shouter, because I, I can't shout or go, but I get really... I do get angry. I'm like, this needs to be like this, this, yeah. this, and this. But to be fair... It's only three of us, me, Ange, and, yeah, yeah. and Lavis, Raven, Pig, whatever you want to depends call it. It depends how you, yeah. depends how you look at it, isn't it? Because I always think like, if it's not being done right, why? Why isn't it being? Yeah, why? And, and yeah. I work back from there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But then you know, then again, I, I've not learned to edit, so who? Am yeah. I, you know, who am I to be saying? Because I've worked in soccer AM and TV for ages, I'm like, I want it. I know how I want it, and I'll, that's enough. Yeah, and I want. I know the color grade. I want it. I want the drone shots. I don't want it to be at, like everyone else is just, you know, holding on yeah, a golf same course. Old, yeah, with a golf, yeah, yeah. With a golf course. I want it to be. And then people say to me, like, yeah, but Tubes, it's YouTube. Pete, it's YouTube. And I'm like, yeah, but because I've come from a, that, I want it to all look nice. And they're like, well, it doesn't need to look nice, but I, I want it to look nice. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I'm quite. I think, you're, I think you're very similar to us, I do. Whereas you've kind of surrounded yourself with people you know can do the job really yeah. well. You okay. trust to do the job really well. And so it's like it's like pressure off, isn't it? Yeah. Same with like you, exactly that, Tom. Like I know that if if he's dealing with something and he said like, yeah, he'll do that, done. I'll do that. It, it's done. Yeah. I haven't got to worry about it. So I haven't got to give any excess energy or thoughts to it kind of thing. Same, same with young Jamie here or Frank, the editor. If we've spoke about it getting done in a certain way and everybody knows their job roles, that's it. And what I think is really, really important, which I've noticed obviously coming here today, all five of you, um, your mates. Yeah. You're having nice. a laugh. You are. And, and that's so important. Yeah. Like me and my brother, like obviously we love each other, we're brothers, but we're mates as well. Yeah, yeah. We're mates and lovers. It's not but like it, work then, is it? No. And that's it's what it should, it's, it's not a normal business though. Because people I've had approaches, various different approaches from people saying, Let's do some coaching, I can do some coaching, I can offer you some services, let's put together this uh, brand plan, activation plan and, and I always say to people our business is different. I yeah. can't. We can't take a normal. Me and Ben can't take like a normal managerial approach with people because it's YouTube. It's colloquial. We hang out together. Yeah. We go to parties together that are work. Yeah. You know, we go and play golf yeah. and and all kinds of things like that. So you can't just say this is my approach. You've got to be so flexible because it's such a 
what's the word? Like a colloquial business. Yeah, for sure. Um, I suppose it's like a football manager, isn't it? You've got to adapt, exactly like, that. Adapt to exactly that. Exactly that. to adapt. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's it's interesting. I always think like I used to work for um, a wine company, and the owner of the business um, started the, the the business from his garage selling wine. Him and his wife. Wow. And the business forty years later is is a huge wine business, and. Because he started it a certain way, his processes might not have always been kind of where I would want them to be. And you kind of say, oh, we could do this differently. We could do that differently. But you just have to accept it because, and like, it could be frustrating at times, but ultimately he led in a way which you'd, you'd take a bullet for him. Yeah, Like exactly. I'd kind of get yeah. frustrated with him on one hand, but then on the other side I'd go, I, I want to please this guy. I want to absolutely nail it for him. Is that what you think about me? Do you think I, was, I need to please him? <laughs> he doesn't He doesn't think he needs to please me when he's got the company bank card and he's spending it all over the shop on absolutely all sorts. It pops up on my phone. I'm thinking, what did you... How have you just spent that at Wagamama's? Oh, my God. No, coffee God. beans, coffee, coffee beans. Coffee beans and Wagamama's and oh, my God. Oh, you want to see the new, the new coffee machine we're getting in the uh, Foscast <laughs> oh, office? Oh, God. Oh, Rhino, oh, Le- Rhino God. Legs loves coffee. That's one thing I learned today. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, addicted to coffee. I'm not answering that one, Ben. Right, how are we going? Come on, we're cooking still, yeah? We are good, we are good. I just want to talk a little bit about more of your old managers, really, mate. Okay. Um, we talked about, like, the biggest influence. Who's, who's, I guess it's hard to say. Is there any that... You're going to say who's the biggest you, prick? No. <laughs> I think Troy answered that one for us, didn't he? <laughs> Pretty much. But is there any that, that style, are there any managerial styles that you've struggled with? Um, no, I think the thing is, as, as a goalkeeper, and especially an older goalkeeper, you learn to just sort of, uh, I know what my job is. I know what my role is. You know what I mean? So even when the managers sort of, unless we're saying about like playing out from the back today, we're going to play out from the back this weekend, or you know what I mean? I need to know the basis, like the, the, the base programme of what we're going to do, whether we're kicking it long, whether we're doing it, slow it down, all that kind of stuff. I know that anyway. But um, what the fuck was I going to say? Hold on. Um, and have you struggled with anyone's style or like... Not got on. Oh yeah, so so yeah, so as an older player, kind of you just you learn to just do what you need to adapt. Do. I know, like saying at the end of the day, my job is to stop the ball going in the back of the net. Yeah. yeah, it is literally it's that. So like you can listen to whatever team talk you want, but my job is to stop the ball going in the back of the net. And then there's little details that follow it, kind of thing. But um, we had a manager at West Brom a few years back, and he actually wasn't there very long. Love, honestly, a lovely bloke, Pepe Mal. His name was right, Spanish yeah, yeah. manager. Do you remember? Yeah. Spanish manager came over, um, took over at a time where we were struggling a bit at West Brom. We were sort of we were in a relegation scrap, real tough relegation scrap. And West Brom as a club had always been. They'd always sort of hired British coaches and it was always done in a very sort of British manager and you'd let the manager fully take control of absolutely everything. Um, and then all of a sudden out of kind of nowhere, they hired this Spanish manager who wanted to come in and play a style of football that just honestly was not suited to what players we had available to us. So he's trying to play out from the back. So in the, he, he, What with Jonas Olsen, Gaz, Gaz McCauley, McCauley, Craig Dawson... Craig Dawson. Like, the biggest bat four in exactly. the world ever. They're not naturally gifted footballers. They're animals. They'll run for a brick great wall. Player. For you. Yeah, they're yeah. great players. They're the kind of guys that you want on your team. But they're not comfortable at getting the ball. Like, I'm not, as a goalie, I'm not. My goalkeeping style is not comfortable giving it to somebody seven yards away, getting it back, opening yeah. it up, giving it to the left back, getting it back. I'm not comfortable doing that. And these guys were definitely not comfortable doing that, right? But he wanted to play this style of football. And I think the chairman wanted to go down a different route of, oh, I want to start playing this new wave of football where people play and all that kind of stuff. And anyway, Pepe came in. He was a lovely guy. He was so, so good. But his English was super limited. I mean, super limited. And it, it quickly became apparent that this style of football was not going to work for us, right? It wasn't. So it was probably only three or four weeks in. And like I said, we only had a couple months left of the season. Our backs were up against the wall anyway. We needed points. So we had to get to a point of like explaining to him, listen, we can't play like this for you. We can't, okay? We really can't. We, did you, did the players go The and players say had to do it. The players went up and wow. we had to say, listen, we can't do this for you. It's like you're trying to put square pegs in round holes. Like it just won't work. How did he right? react? And do you know what? He was acting, because he's a good bloke, and he, he, uh, it was a, it must have been a bit of an ego thing where it would probably bruise your ego a little bit to have your players come up and say that. But he took it so well. Like that's, that's a testament to him as a bloke that he literally was like, all right. And we spoke about what we, we want to do and how we should do it and blah, 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 and this and that. And we bought um, the, the 
basically the assistant manager was Keith Downing who had been in the club anyway and he came in and he was happy to sort of help us and he was doing a lot of the talking anyway because Pepe's was so his English was so poor so anyway it got to the point where we decided on playing a different style of football Keith would have done a lot more hands on stuff in showing us because that's not Pepe's Mao's style of football so he would take a lot of the coaching sessions even on a match day Keith would take a lot of the match day stuff where he would be showing the players what to do talking a lot more because Pepe's English um, and eventually like I say it all kind of fell into place a bit more we picked up results we started winning we didn't get relegated we stayed up it was fantastic and I think when when something like that happens like everybody really liked Pepe but it was obvious he wasn't going to work at that football club and then he only must have stayed for about probably four or five months in total but at the end of the season he was let go and that's when we got a new manager in but it was a bit of a big thing at the time Do you, yeah. can you imagine going into a to like a manager and saying listen this ain't working it's not a great thing, not a great place to be. Well, but credit to the players, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah, I know, yeah. To all group yeah. together and do that, some would be like, oh, no, I don't want to go and do that. No, so I think and- we, had, we, had had a, we had a group of players who had been there for a long time and we knew what our strengths were. We knew as a club what our strengths were because yeah, we'd yeah. been there for so long together. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of, we had to do it then or, or never, basically. Because if we didn't do it, we'd have got relegated trying to play out from the back. Talking about the um, language barrier, um didn't you have quite a rousing team talk from the Birmingham owner once? Oh my gosh, this was so painful. <laughs> oh my gosh. So like I said, but like I said earlier in the pod, Alex McLeish is really good at halftime team talks. Yeah, really good. He's like dead passionate and you listen to him, you respect him and you want to do it for him anyway. And um, it was the second to last game from the season. It was, We were at home to Fulham and um, we basically knew that if we didn't beat Fulham, we'd go into the last game of the season away at Tottenham and we'd need to win them. We'd need to beat them to stay up, to stand any chance of staying up, basically. So that Fulham game was, it was a must-win game. And I think we're 1-0 down at half-time or 0-0 at half-time or something like that anyway. And it wasn't going great. And the lads were low on confidence. It was a horrible place to be. The manager's done his thing. And then anyway, like the doors started like rambling, like because he had locked it, but it started moving kind of thing. So somebody went and opened it. And it was the owner, which is Carson Young. And Carson Young was like this Chinese businessman, yeah, yeah. kind of whatever. He, but uh, it transpires he was obviously a bit dodgy, like because he's—I think he's in jail now, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> allegedly. allegedly. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so he's he's come walking in and he's dressed a bit like Alves, yeah. He's got these like—it's so bonkers, mate. I'd love to have had my GoPro on me or something. So I'm gonna film that. I'm going, what on oh, earth is going on, oh. guys? Get a load of this. Like he's walked in. He's got these like big long lapels on his shirt he's got these white silk gloves on yeah like like a snooker referee or something yeah <laughs> he's in and he, again he's English he can't speak English like he must know one or two words like and he, he literally just went it, it, we all kind of looked at him as if to say what on earth is going to happen here and he just went win win and then he literally looked at every player and turned his body as he's doing it win 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 and we were just going oh this is mad this is so mad and then walked out and then walked out. <laughs> and then walked out. And like even even Alex McLeish like looked at us as if to say, What the fuck just happened then? Like it was so weird, so random. Um but yeah, we didn't win. We <laughs> <laughs> We didn't win. And, but it weren't for want of trying, it was what it was. Do you know what I mean? We lost that game, went away to Tottenham. I think we I think we might have lost two one away at Tottenham as well, ended up getting relegated. It was a shame as well, to be fair, because I did love it at Blues. Absolutely. Yeah, but it's all, yeah, that is as about as weird as it gets. But yeah. about talking about chairmans and um team talks. Remember Dave Whelan from Wigan? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bullard's tells me a story where they were, they were trying to get promotion or something. And Dave Whelan just went, right, we've got to win this game. And, and there's, a, there's, there's thousands of reasons why. And just chucked this bag, oh. full of, this leather bag, just full of cash. Oh. And, everyone, and everyone was like, oh, fuck, fucking hell. Lads, and, and they, win. <laughs> win, 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 win. <laughs> Literally they ran out and said they won it. And All the lads were going, win, win, win. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Win, yeah. win, 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 win. That's an interesting one then, Fozzie. So money, yeah. most footballers have played very well, as we know. What's more important incentivizing a footballer with, money or days off? Days off is the biggest currency in football. <laughs> it is the most valuable commodity there is, I promise you, right? If, if we win a game, yeah, if we win a game and the manager says... Two days off, lads. Oh my gosh. Honestly, it is yeah, the biggest roar you've heard, honestly. Like that two days off. Every player goes, Oh my god, thank God for that. It is yeah, it is the best thing a manager can say. It's it more than money, more than anything. 
Days off is like, oh, wow. I think that's like everyone, isn't it? Everyone loves yeah. a bit of time off. Don't Everybody they? loves a bit of time off. Because yeah. you can't, you're, like say, footballers, we're away a lot. We are. We're away an awful lot. So the thought of having two days of being able to go back to your family, go just home, chill. chill, take. But it's not even just your body, it's your mental. Like yeah. to take your head away from football. You haven't got to think about training or the pressures and stresses, all that kind of stuff. It is. It's worth its weight in gold. And what is it like the day after at a football club? What is it like the day after when a manager's been canned? Yeah, um, it's... Honestly, it it just carries on as normal. It does. does. It? it just carries on as normal, Tubes. It, um, because it's so common nowadays. Like, I'd love to know what the average shelf life is for a manager. It's yeah. less than a year, I guarantee it. Depends on the club, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, but I guarantee in general, so like on an average, just on. It, just, it just carries on. Like, you just carry on. Somebody, somebody will be there to take the training session... Um, the the owner, the chairman might come down and have a few words and say, listen, it wasn't working out, this and that and whatever. Um, but it just carries on as normal. Like say we're, as players, I think if we get too kind of into it and too emotional and embroiled in it, then it will probably end up affecting our performance to some level. But you just, you just deal with it. You just move on. Like we don't, as players, we don't hear that a manager's going to get sacked before anyone else. We hear at the same time as what the world hears, hears it. And it's normally on Sky Sports News, I was say, when it's on Twitter, on. Instagram, whatever it is. We hear it You're exactly. Not the heads up. You don't get any heads up whatsoever. No text message. The same as when a new manager's about to come in. You don't, like, we don't hear or see anything. What about the captain of the guys. club? Is that, he's like, the you know, the most senior players and, and the club captain. Do they get any insight? No, again, like with the 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 pro- I'd say the captain is probably the first person to meet the new manager. The captain will be the first person to meet the new manager because somebody from the club will send a message to the captain and say, right, the new manager's been appointed today. It is blah de blah. When you, can you get in half an hour early to meet him to go and speak to him? And that's pr- that's probably the only person that will have a little bit of a head start on everybody else. But other than that, we we you don't know until a manager's been appointed until you see it on Sky. So we could turn up every day. Not be a manager there, but then see on Sky later on, and that's it. Yeah, we don't that's get any crazy. insight. I know. Yeah. I honestly thought you'd get like a, a day before. Like, no, this nothing. Is all we've appointed absolutely nothing. Tubes, you've had a, an encounter with um, one of the what, one, one of the old Watford managers, it haven't was you? Bizarre. It was just the weirdest thing. I mean, I wasn't doing the interview. Fennens was there interviewing Troy, and at your training ground. There's like a. There must be. I don't know if it's still there. This was years ago. There's a shower at the end, and there's like literal loads of changing rooms. It's coming off. Is that right? And like a yeah, they've period. changed a bit. To be fair, but I used to be there years ago when yeah. it was like that. Yeah. So I don't know which manager it was. We we're doing the interview, so we just heard the flip flops going, dup, dup, dup. and it was one of the managers, and he was just stood there with his fucking chopper out, <laughs> and he just put, he just put his head around. And was like, all right. He didn't say all right because he was not English. He was like, I think I can't remember what nationality it was. He was just like. Hey. And we were just like Troy Dean, he fell as me, just like <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> it was just you know when a, you know geezer knows he's got a big chopper. Oh, was yeah. it a chopper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cho- yeah. So well, did like... you not say oh happy for you, mate? <laughs> yeah. well, well, well done, you. Well, well done, mate. Well, well done. Well done. Well, good, good chopper. <laughs> but yeah, he was one of those guys that he knew he had a big one, so he was like, I don't need a towel, just walking swinging around, it. Just swinging it around. Like... I would, to be fair, yeah, if I, could. I would as well. Yeah, I would as well. Right, but yeah. it, it was the most bizarre thing. We were just like. What, should we crack on with the interview? He's like, yeah, that's the gaffer. Oh, bonkers. <laughs> mad. Oh, it's mad. And all yeah. the stuff that you see behind the scenes, I'm sure people think it's like it's like a glossy world. No, mate, there's so much random stuff oh, goes on, isn't there? Mourinho, Mourinho was the one which made me laugh when he was at United. Um, and like, it was so bizarre. I'd never met him. I'd never met Mourinho. So I spoke to a few of the ex-Chelsea boys. And they were like, oh, don't worry, Tubes. He's well all right. He, um, yeah, he actually likes you. He thinks you used to watch you on Soccer AM like, when we were at Chelsea together. So I was like, and apparently, the, leading up to it, he'd already upset two or three reporters wow. just saying, get out, get out, get out. So I was like, right. Okay, so I've got my ammo. I've got John Terry. He's, 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 JT said, say hello to him. So Karen was, Karen, the um, press yeah, officer. Oh, yeah, cool, yeah, yeah, cool, yeah. yeah shout and she was like, yeah, he's not in a great mood. Like, oh, oh God, it's right. not a good start, is okay, it? So anyway. He's um, so he's walked in the door, and he's like, and he, and he was like, he had his phone with him, and he just pressed start, ten minute countdown. Oh like no! That. So he's like, he sat there. I was like, but when I got, I get embarrassed, I start to laugh. <laughs> so I went, I went, training good, and he went, yep, 
Oh, and, then, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then looked at his phone. I went, I went, oh, I, I play my card here. I play my card. I went, <clears throat> JT said hello. And he went, <laughs> didn't say anything. <laughs> didn't say a word. So anyway, and then so then the, the cameraman are trying to get scramble around together. He was like, he was like, come on, come on, hurry up, hurry up. And one of the cameramen is falling over because <laughs> he's rushing. He's fallen over the light, gone boom, got the floor. Like, at this stage, I'm turning that way. He's there, and I'm pissing myself laughing. Karen's going, don't laugh. And you can see my my shoulders got kind of trying to laugh. He's there fuming, like proper fuming like that. And then the geezer got up off the floor. He was like, right, cool. And he was like, right, six, six, six minutes. And I was like, and I was like, I was trying not to laugh. And just before I started to speak to him, he just winked. He was like, like you're all right. Because I was like, he's going to tell me to fuck off and get out of it. Because he, he knew I was laughing at him. He's just killed you for six minutes yeah. in your 10 minute interview. Yeah. And then he's just done, and he just winked and gone like that. And then he was good as gold. Good as gold. Yeah. But it was the weirdest thing. That's super weird. It's so weird. But then, That's when, awkward, but then when like... he went to Spurs, the nicest. I walked in and was like, hey, how you doing? I'm yeah. Like, he like, rebranded himself a bit I'm for like, Spurs, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. When he first went into Spurs, he rebranded it a bit as if to yeah. be like, I'm, oh, he, I think he even made a point of saying, no, I'm going to be different Jose I'm going to be chirpy cheerful not get bogged down with it and it lasted about three weeks didn't it yeah. and then he was back to same old same no, old no but to be fair I did him twice at Spurs and each time he was great good as gold great. Yeah. but I think in the first interview at Spurs I asked him I said I thought you I thought you hated me at United and he was like no 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 no, no. can't hate the you, tubes you, Come could, on. you could tell he wasn't happy at United oh he, but, yeah. he was a different animal wasn't yeah, he? he but was, honestly yeah. that was his last interview before he got sacked wow at United's the one where he's doing all that with his phone but honestly, it was so cringe. Oh, oh. JT's as low. It's like, I'm give the fuck, mate. Well, you mentioned the JT yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, I was, oh. I was trying anything. Yeah, good, good training. So, Do you know what? One thing I want to talk about managers, actually, is I've got one story, right? I've got one story about knowing if a manager's going to get sacked or not. Again, we don't. We don't know if, if managers are going to get sacked or not. Right? We don't, honestly. We don't hear anything. We remember, we only read in the press. You know, you know you'll always see like the latest manager odds to get sacked, all that kind of stuff. You'll hear, hear press murmurings. He's right. He's got one game to save his blah, blah, blah. One, one time when I was at West Brom, um, Steve Clark was manager and... Uh, we'd just gone through a bit of a, a bad patch of playing games and it was exactly that where we knew that if we were to lose one or two or three of our next matches or whatever, the manager could be getting the canned, could be getting canned, sorry. And we were we had an away game somewhere and we got back to the training ground, right? And it, we must have got back to the training ground at about 11 o'clock at night, pitch black normally. It's pitch black. There's no lights on in the building whatsoever normally. It's, you know what I mean? Everyone's gone home for the day. We got back about 11 o'clock at night. All the lights were on at the training ground. Everyone's oh, office. no. The chairman's office, the chief executive's <laughs> office, the chief chief executive, all of their the lights chief, were chief on. Chief executive, <laughs> all of right? yeah. that role, I ain't got it? a clue. <laughs> I ain't got a clue. But all of their lights were on, right? So we pulled into the training ground, and you can just see it in front of you, right? <laughs> wow. All these lights are on, and we've all looked at each other and gone, oh, <laughs> he's no. a But bear in mind, he's at the front of the coach. Like, the manager's oh. at the front of the coach. So he's the first one to see it. But we've seen all these lights and we were just like, oh no. And so at this point, you do the biggest shit housery thing ever. You get your bag on and get in your car. <laughs> <laughs> so here's you get gone. Here's one for you. <laughs> and yeah, he got, he, yeah, he got, I think yeah. it was like, probably the next morning or something. Yeah, sacked. Probably Ooh. at midnight. <laughs> yeah. Horrible. So, what about one thing we didn't touch on about was what about managers getting involved in banter with the boys? Um, yeah, you've got to be a certain type of manager. Um, a lot of the time, even if they've got awful banter, you always just go. <laughs> <laughs> you, oh, you're, a, yeah, you're a show pony. You're a Sausage, show pony. You are. <laughs> Crazy cat. <laughs> It's the same in any walk of life. I don't care what job you've got, right? Yeah. If your manager tries to give you a bit of banter, you suck up to them like you you do, don't you? I do it now. I'm 38 years old and I'm not ashamed to say it. I would yeah, like, he, la he laughs at all my jokes. He laughs at all my jokes. <laughs> oh, guys, that was an absolute bower. That was manager talk and I thoroughly oh, wow. enjoyed it. Tomasi, Love world it. class. Tunes. Cool. Thanks for having me. As always, man, thank you, thank you so, so much. much. And as usual, thank you for listening. Up the Fozcast. Up the Fozcast. Up the Fozcast. Boom. Love it. Well done, boys. Well done. <laughs>